Let me introduce um, the fifth paper by Gordon Melton, uh, distinguished professor. Uh, Gordon is interesting because he writes all these encyclopedias on religion and reference books. And he's the only guy I know that doesn't worry about technology because if his PowerPoint doesn't work or if he forgets his briefcase, it doesn't matter. It's all up here. He's never forgot anything. Um, he knows about churches, even if they only have, if a denomination has eight members, he knows most of them. Um, so uh, he is a walking encyclopedia and uh, he's batting cleanup for us today. Welcome, Gordon Melton. While Francis is getting my PowerPoint up and going, uh, I wanted to do something a little bit different uh, this morning and uh, talk about the research that uh, I've been doing in atheism the last four or five years. Uh, I was raised as a kind of a classic church historian and then became a religious historian and now a irreligious historian, I guess you could say. Uh, but I got concerned about atheism uh, four or five years ago, uh, held a conference on it uh, just actually the weekend before I moved to uh, Texas. Uh, we did a conference on the history of atheism at San Diego State University. And I've been reading uh, uh, in the, all the news clippings that have come out, uh, all of the statements about concern with atheism, the last three popes have all made multiple statements that atheism was the greatest concern facing the church today. Uh, a number of ministers and religious leaders here in our own country have made it, made similar kinds of statements. So I wanted to see if I could figure out, uh, is that the right one? Oh, there we go. Uh, but very definitely, for the first time since the 1960s, uh, atheism is back on the religious agenda. Uh, why is that the case? Uh, one of the main reasons is the rise of neo-atheism. Neo-atheism is a movement that arose about 10 years ago. Uh, it's the Christopher Hitchens, uh, uh, Sam Harris, uh, uh, Dawkins, uh, that group, very aggressive form of, of uh, uh, atheism. Uh, you pick it up from uh, Hitchens' work, uh, God is uh, not great. Uh, kind of in your face, con confrontational uh, approach to atheism. Uh, mainly trying to mobilize the atheist community to grow. They've had quite an impact, a number of best-selling books. It's an interesting group to get to know uh, along the way. Uh, Sam Harris, who's one of the leading members, turns out to be a closet Buddhist, uh, has just revealed that. But neo-atheism has had its effect. Second thing has been the Christian reaction to the not the growth of atheism, but the growth of the presence of atheism in the media stream as the media has reacted to neo-atheism and to the number of people who have uh, emerged to try to confront this new wave of atheist interest. Uh, we have seen over the, na uh, the last 10 years the growth for example, of the number of debates between atheists and uh, usually conservative Protestant Christians over the existence of God, and the number of books on atheism written by Christians has uh, markedly risen recently. The other thing, and the, uh, a new interesting thing about atheism is the growth of organized atheism. Uh, atheism is not a movement that tends to produce community. It tends to produce village atheists, uh, so to speak, uh, individuals who have opinions of, of atheism. 
But in the last few uh, years, particularly, we have seen the growth of organized uh, uh, atheism. There is now an atheist church in Houston that brings in about 1,500 people every Sunday for uh, church services. It's called Oasis Houston. You wouldn't know that it was an atheist group from its name, but uh, it's thriving. Uh, the oldest atheist church in the country is actually located in Dallas. I was up uh, last month to its 20th anniversary gathering, um, still going strong after lo these many years. And finally, the main thing that has put atheism back on the agenda has been the discovery of the nuns, uh, which uh, you have heard reference to, and we'll talk about some more as we move along through this uh, period. Uh, the nuns are an interesting group, and getting to know them is an interesting part of it. But the fact that the nuns have been identified as the growing irreligious in the country has uh, captured the imagination. We have two documents on the nuns, a report that Pew published in 07 and another in 12, uh, 2012, uh, which seems to indicate their growth. Uh, but uh, that's part of what has, has provoked the interest. I want to take a, a few minutes to talk about atheism and where it came from and how we got there. If you went back to 1500, uh, 1500, uh, you're talking about a, a couple of decades before the Reformation gets off the ground, uh, you would have, uh, could not find an atheist. They just didn't exist at this particular time. As a matter of fact, you, could, you would be hard pressed to find anything in, in Western Europe, uh, in most of Europe at this time, other than people who were either Orthodox or Catholic Christians and a few Muslims. Uh, that would all change fairly quickly. Within one generation, the Catholic synthesis had been uh, destroyed. Europe had been divided into uh, Catholic and several brands of Protestantism. And in the seams in the middle, other things began to happen. One of the things that began to happen is that Christian orthodoxy was challenged. While Protestants did not challenge the, the basic orthodox beliefs of the faith, a few people did, and among them was Michael Servetus. And he began to challenge the doctrine of the Trinity and began to say that God was one. So his oneness movement, which eventually becomes Unitarianism, presents the first major challenge to the orthodox Christian belief that had dominated in uh, Europe uh, for the previous millennium. Uh, a couple of hundred years later, we begin to get uh, other forms of challenging uh, to uh, the dominant belief, and this comes primarily in the 18th century in the form of deism. Uh, one of the first of the deists is uh, uh, Lord Herbert. Uh, deism is in, in, similar to Unitarianism in that it offers a belief in one God rather than a triune God, but it's uh, a step in another direction in that while Unitarianism presented itself as true Christianity, saying that we are biblical Christianity and we have gotten rid of all of this, these accretions that have been built up over the years, uh, such as the Trinity, uh, the deists were saying, uh, we have an understanding of God, one God, but he is a God who's not really concerned about us. Uh, a God who creates the world and goes off and leaves the world to run on its own. The great architect of the universe, uh, to use the, the words uh, that became popular at this time. Uh, the implication of this God is that uh, he doesn't care about worship, 
So worship is superfluous. God's not listening. Doesn't answer prayer. Not concerned about us. And obviously doesn't work miracles. Because he's off doing other things. He's left us on our own. Uh, The Unitarians set up a church. Continue the worship of Uh, what they considered to be true Christianity. The deists, on the other hand, did not challenge the church. The deists were good Anglicans. Uh, They lived, died as Anglicans, buried as Anglicans. Um, If you looked at their biography, you would find nothing untoward about them. But they just uh, didn't believe that God was concerned. They said, instead of challenging the church or putting up another organization, they said, well, what the church should be doing is teaching us morals. So they wanted to turn the church into a moral school. Uh, This is uh, Hume. I was recently in Edinburgh past his statue, so I had to take a picture of it, uh, who was one of the first to work out the implications of deism for miracle, our understanding of miracles. Now, Unitarianism, deism, and uh, a third school, universalism, which challenged Christian doctrines on hell, uh, are all transferred to the British American colonies in the 18th century. Joseph Priestley here on the left uh, founds the first Unitarian church in in, uh, Philadelphia. Uh, John Murray there in the middle founds the first Universalist church. John Adams, our second president, was a Unitarian, very active member of the Unitarian group in uh, uh, Massachusetts. Major deists in the country, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, Uh, very popular, you know, Jefferson put out a Bible in which he went through and kind of cut out all the unbelievable parts of it, namely the part where God and man interact with each other uh, and leaves uh, a Bible which is only uh, with moral codes. Franklin was well known for the fact uh, he used his wealth to give a little money to all the churches but not much to any of them. Uh, the real deist leader in terms of ideology was Thomas Paine. Uh, uh, he was a great supporter of the revolution, but after the revolution began to write his deist uh, uh, articles and a book uh, that got him, uh, made him very unpopular for a few minutes. And he wound up going to England uh, there. The question becomes, Deism is very popular in and around uh, at least uh, Philadelphia, New York, uh, that area uh, at the time of the revolution. But what happens afterwards? Uh, What happens is that a number of of deistic societies are created. Unitarianism begins to grow in New England. It had been just a very small movement uh, at the time of the American Revolution, but it gets bigger and bigger and finally splits the Congregational Church and every town in Massachusetts had to choose between being uh, Unitarian or Congregational and a lot of them became uh, Unitarian. Uh, But the real uh, thing that begins to happen is that a new movement grows up, it's called Free Thought. And that movement becomes very, very popular during the early 19th century. Deistic uh, societies form, and the first atheists actually begin to appear. It's in the 18th century in Europe that the first atheist, as a modern atheist that we think of, uh, appear. Uh, One of the interesting things is that among the very first atheist groups in in the United States, are two communities here in Texas, uh, Bernie and Comfort, Texas. These are towns that are formed in the early 1840s from, uh, by atheists who come from uh, Europe. 
uh, in the founding documents of these two towns says that no church can actually be formed inside the city limits. And this has some interesting uh, aspects to it. It's the church, the Catholic church that was formed right outside of Bernie that uh, in the 1990s becomes a key, ca uh, key case that brings down the Religious Freedom Ref Restoration Act. Uh, the, but a number of uh, atheist groups going usually under the name Free Thought begin to form. Uh, Abner Nealon uh, is a Universalist minister in, in Massachusetts who has uh, uh, convicted of blasphemy, the last person to so do this. He then moves to Kansas, founds some, one of the first atheist periodicals in the country that uh, grows out of a little, comes out of a little town called Liberty, uh, Kansas. This is the first avowed atheist that we know of in America, a fellow named Robert Owen, who founded a community on the banks of the Wabash, which we know today as New Harmony, uh, built a he was trying to build this uh, utopian community there. He got a few buildings built. If you go to New Harmony, you can see them. Uh, his son uh, tied up with a woman named Frances Wright. They moved to New York, continued the cause uh, up until the, through the 1850s. Then after the American uh, uh, Revolution, atheism got its real uh, growth, uh, hit a real growth phase during the 18, late 1860s, 1870s. The Free Religious Association was the most secular aspect of Unitarianism and it began to form. Uh, William Potter was uh, among the founders. The very first member of the Free Religious Association who signed up after the, the association was formed was Ralph Waldo Emerson, a name you may have heard of. Louisa May Alcott, the writer, was a, a prominent member of the group. Uh, and the Free Religious Association then gave way to the National Liberal League. This was the first national atheist organization in the country that was formed in 1876. It grew out of a court case uh, in New Hampshire in which a Unitarian minister was kicked out of his church because he wasn't Christian enough. Uh, and he went on to found, uh, Francis Abbott went on to found the uh, uh, National Liberal League. Uh, the National Liberal League, uh, presented a set of, of uh, demands, this was the principles. Most of them had to do with separation of church and state and uh, not what we generally think of as separation of church and state. It's what, uh, the difference between what I call the American and the French style, the American style, separation of church and state but the government remains friendly to religion. The French style, separation of church and state, the government remains hostile to religion. And uh, what they were looking for was a French-style separation. Uh, Robert Ingersoll, primary member, uh, he was a lawyer from Peoria, Illinois, uh, almost ran for president. He was a very popular politician. Uh, uh, Bennett uh, created the first national uh, atheist periodical. It's still in existence. The truth seeker comes out of San Diego today, but it's a much different kind of publication. Then how do we get from the National Liberal League, which lasted oh, to the, into the beginning of the 20th century, to four million atheists in 1944? Uh, well, the answer is that we begin to get uh, a number of atheists uh, organizations that begin to form. The American Ethical Union grows out of the National Liberal League, was, was a large early humanist group formed in New York uh, as a, it was Jewish in its uh, origins, but became much more than Jewish very quickly. Haldeman Julius is a little publishing house in Kansas that, was, that originated what we think of as the paperback revolution. They were putting out cheap paperbacks in the 30s and many of them were atheist reprints from uh, England. 
The American Association for the Advancement of Atheism was formed in San Diego in 1920. Well, it's formed in New York, moved to San Diego uh, in 1925. The Free Thinkers of America, a good old boy from Alabama, moved to New York, became an atheist, and formed the Free Thinkers of America. And then, most importantly, the American Humanist Association uh, came along. We'll talk about it a little bit more in a minute. But atheism was really carried by a number of other different movements. Um, socialism, communism grows up at the end of the 19th century in America. It's the largest of the atheist groups. Uh, psychotherapy, you know, Freud writes his book, The Future of an Illusion. Uh, women, the women's rights movement had a very strong atheist component to it. Freemasonry uh, continued the deist. Uh, emphasis and uh, various forms of new uh, non-theistic philosophies begin to arise, pragmatism, logical positivism, most of them. Uh, Felix Sadler is the founder of the American Ethical Union. He's a rabbi in New York. Uh, this is Charles Smith, who is the uh, head of the American Association for the Advancement of Atheism in San Diego. Uh, he, he teamed up with Amy Simple McPherson, the Pentecostal minister, and they did a dog and pony show around the country uh, arguing about God. This is Joseph Lewis, the boy from Alabama, who forms the Free Thinkers of America, and here's John Dietrich, the father of religious humanism. Uh, the American Humanist Association were, was founded basically by former Unitarians who lost their belief in God but still wanted to do religion. And so they begin to form humanist churches. And the American Humanist Association is now the biggest non-theistic group in the country. Uh, since World War II, we have seen a number of things happen. But let me give you a, a very quick overview. This is a, a picture of religious growth. The top line in this curve is population. Uh, the bottom line is uh, uh, Christianity, you know, uh, total church membership. As you can see at the beginning of the country when the dust settles from the American Revolution, only about 10 to 12 percent of the people were church members. The great majority of people were not part of the church. Uh, you can, if you uh, uh, read the conversion stories of people through the 19th century, you can see what life was like in, in the majority of the country. It took a long time to build a church that we know in America today. Church membership grows. It's continually growing ahead of the population through the 19th century. So by the time of the Civil War, it's hitting 20-25%. By the time, by the beginning of the 20th century, church membership has grown to around 30, 33 percent, about a third of the country. It's only World War II when half of the American people become church members. Only in World War II. And in World War II, what that means is that in uh, 1940, half of the American public not church members, not part of any religious organization at all. Now, since uh, 1950, we have seen the rise of uh, organized unbelief. These are now the national atheist organizations that are functioning in the country. There are basically eight of them, and the Secular Coalition is their National Council of Churches. That's the ecumenical group for atheist uh, groups. There are two groups that are primarily Jewish, and Society for Jewish Humanism uh, has about 35, 40 synagogues around the country. Congress of Secular Jewish Organizations are non-religious Jewish secularists. This is a map of all of the humanist and atheist centers in America. There's some interesting things about it. Uh, the largest body of non-believers in the country now is probably the Unitarians. Uh, they have a huge humanist component uh, and maybe 50,000 members who are, are uh, 
a non-theist. Uh, the other group is the American Humanist Association. That clutter up in Massachusetts and in New England, that's mostly Unitarians up there, but the rest is spread out. You'll see there's a little uh, line of groups that run down the 35 corridor here in, in uh, central Texas. Uh, this is a, an interesting thing. If you measure the different groups, the atheist, uh, over on the left extreme is the American Atheist Association, uh, that the one that Madeleine Murray O'Hare founded down the road in Austin. Um, the second is the American Humanist Association. Uh, what's interesting about this is they're very small groups. We're talking about anywhere from two to five to 10,000 members. A uh, few get up above 20 but it's the American Humanist Association, the religious humanist, has more than all of the other groups combined. Uh, they're just not very strong. They're not going anywhere uh, in the next week. Uh, then we have the rise of the nuns. And uh, we we'll wanna talk just a minute about who are the nuns. We've got three basic ways of measuring religion in America. One of them is affiliation. Uh, who are you affiliated with as a religious group? I'm a Methodist. Second one is what do you do about your religion if you have one or don't have one? What do you do that's religious? That is, do you pray? Do you uh, attend a community somewhere and worship together with people? Do you have a sense of the divine operating in the world around you and in your life? That's one way. Third way is, is by religious identity. Uh, what's your religion? How do you identify yourself if someone asks you about religion? As I said, I'm a Methodist. I'm a member of a local Methodist congregation here in Waco. I attend uh, every Sunday I'm in town. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and when I'm out of town, I generally try to find a Methodist church to go to. I've got those three things uh, together. But if you, as you've heard from our other speakers, a lot of people don't have those together. For example, we have a large congregation here in town called the Antioch Church. Now, if you ask someone who's a member of the Antioch Church, what's your religion, what do you say? Uh, I'm an Antiochian? Uh, no, probably not. If you go to the Gateway Church up in Dallas, what do they say? I'm a gatewayer? Uh, so there's, a, there's some problems with that. Uh, and this is the problem with the nuns that we've get, we get into the news coverage of them. What the nuns are, are those people who don't identify with any particular religion when they're asked the question, what's your religion? Now, it doesn't mean that they are not a member of a church, and it doesn't mean that they don't go to church, it doesn't mean that they don't pray, and it doesn't mean they don't have a sense of the divine in their life. It only means they don't have a clear image of what they are religiously. They don't have that together. Most people, for example, who say, I'm spiritual but not religious, are members of a religious group, but more than likely they're esoterics. Esotericism membership makes up five, six percent of the population. That's, they're more esoteric people. Uh, we used to call them a cult, cultist. Uh, but they're more esoteric people than there are atheists. They have groups all around the country. Uh, uh, in some of the cities, they have uh, large churches. Uh, most of the times they meet in homes, so they become fairly invisible on the landscape. Uh, but they, don't, they identify religion with what you do in churches. Well, they have other kinds of groups. They don't call their groups churches. So they're not religious. 
but they may be very, very active uh, religious people. And when we look at the uh, religious landscape, this is uh, religious growth uh, since 1950. As you can see, in 1950, we're hitting church membership at about 50%. Well, today, church membership is 78%. That's phenomenal. There's never been a culture that has had voluntary religious allegiance without the government either backing or hindering it that has reached such a high, high percentage. You're living in one of the most religious countries that has ever existed on the face of the earth since, you know, primitive times where culture and religion were all the same thing. Uh, uh, between the red line and the population line, that shows we've had a remarkable growth in population. You, moving this century, in the past century, we've moved from 100 million to 200 million to 300 million and more people. So we've had tremendous population growth. But church membership is just phenomenal. Now you look at that little green line down at the bottom, that's atheism. It's a flat line. It's hung in there since we started measuring it in the 40s. It's hung in there at 4 to 5 percent. So the number of atheists have grown, but the number of Christians has just grown off the map. Now, why do we get reports of people de of religion declining? Well, we get it from anecdotal things. My church has declined. I'm a Methodist. My church has gone from uh, 10 million to 8 million members over the, this period of time. Uh, but the rest of them uh, have continued to grow. Half of the American public, over 150 million people, are members of just 25 denominations. But we have a thousand denominations in America. And that's where you get that other 25% who, who uh, and that's where a lot of the growth has. Half of, uh, uh, of the 1,000 denominations, 600 of them have been formed since 1965, which means they weren't around for your grandparents to attend, maybe for your parents, but that's where you get all the switching. If you've got that many formed, and there have been uh, several hundred formed in the last four or five years, uh, that's, that's, they're, they're leaving and going to form those new denominations that are growing up. And they're also going there to fill out the population growth. Because if we've got a hundred million people here who weren't here a generation ago, somebody's got to meet their religious needs. Now, in that 20% between the red and the blue, that's where many of the nuns are. But only 12 million of them are atheists. How about the other 50 million of them? Well, they are part of the other thousand religious groups in the country who are not Christian. We have a thousand Christian denominations. We have a thousand non-Christian denominations. We have 200 Buddhist denominations. One of them, has 300,000 members, the Nishiren Shoshu of America. It's the largest Buddhist group in the country. The largest Hindu temple in the country is located in Atlanta. It's put up by a group called the Swami Narayans, who I bet you've never heard of. They have 100,000 members in America. So these folks are not, not religious. They are religious in ways that you might not recognize at this point in time. What it means is that something like 95, 90%, 96% of all the American people are religiously affiliated. Now they're religiously affiliated in many ways. They may be core members of a group, they may be active 
uh, attendees of a group, they may be nominal members of a group, but 95, 96% of all the people in America are religiously affiliated. Religion is a growing concern and religion is alive and well and it's gone from the uh, future of an illusion to an illusion with a future, <laughs> as you could say. Now, what can we say about the atheists to close out? We can say that the atheists have been pretty stagnant. We now know that neo-atheism was a reaction to the stagnant condition of the atheist community, but a decade down the road, as far as we can tell, neo-atheism has not added anyone to the atheist community. Um, it's taken over a couple of the old atheist organizations, but it hasn't added in to their membership. Uh, the nuns are on the decline. The nuns have, were 65% uh, of the population at the beginning of the 20th century. Now they're around 20%. Uh, in 1900, they were not members of any religious group. Today they are. Uh, it's just not Christian groups. Uh, and so at that point, I will leave you and if there are any questions, and then I think uh, my colleagues are going to join me, and we'll all take questions from you. Yes, ma'am. What makes, what makes something a denomination? Uh, we use uh, terms primary, secondary, and tertiary groups. A primary group, a denomination, is, a, is the organization that holds the basic mem religious membership of people. Uh, the way we, we uh, structure religion in the country is that most denominations have local centers that meet weekly. So, for example, it's hard for you to be a Baptist, a Methodist, and a Lutheran at the same time because they meet at the same time. You, can't, you can only go to one of them. And uh, so if you take, say, the United Methodist Church and the Southern Baptist and uh, the Evangelical Lutherans and say that's a denomination, so it's the organizations that compete with them for a worshiping community on the weekends. And, uh, and they, each of the denominations differ from others at usually two or three major points. That's what causes it. It's either they differ in their worship style, they differ in their belief system, or they differ in uh, their leadership and how they administer it. There aren't that many independent churches. Um, most groups, most of what we think of as independent churches are just congregations of denominations we've never heard of. Uh, of those, for example, the Antioch Church here. The Antioch Church is the lead church of a large denomination. There are 25 congregations. They have their own seminary. Um, most people are not aware that the, the Antioch Church is just one church of a denomination. And you drive around town, you see churches with names you don't recognize um, or nondescript names. They're, they're usually part of a larger denominational group. It's hard to survive as an independent congregation. Uh, you have too many problems you have to solve. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm wondering, uh, I grew up like some here in conservative churches that were fond of saying we're not part of a religion, we're part of a relationship. It, would there, has anyone parsed any of these numbers of nuns, whether there might be people who are choosing to say I'm not religious because I'm an evangelical Christian? Uh, Karl Barth, who was a prominent uh, theologian back in the mid 20th century, I think he died in the 70s if I remember correctly, uh, did this huge set of, uh, of his uh, dogmatics that we all read when I, when I was going through school anyway. Uh, he 
is one who helped popularize a phrase that got stuck with uh, Bonhoeffer called religionless Christianity. Uh, he was uh, very adamant, spends the, the best part of the prolegomena to the dogmatics talking about why uh, Christianity is not a religion. And between Bonhoeffer and Barth and their disciples, uh, religion kind of got a bad name among conservative uh, Christians, just like denomination did. So you have a lot of denominations who like to think of themselves as non-denominational. Uh, uh, denomination, by the way, is the way you structure religion in a free society, because that's you, you, you form competing groups with each other. Um, uh, but in our own day, religion has become, for many people, a bad word. So uh, they want to avoid it. They want to be spiritual but not religious, or they want uh, to do something that separates them from traditional religion. Uh, it's, it's kind of a thing. And one of the problems that you run into in the conversation, we have... We have three major definitions of religion we use. One is a, a popular man on the street definition. If you went out on the street and asked people what, what is religion, they would usually describe what they grew up with or what they knew about as they were growing up. Then we have some very formal definitions that are academic definitions. And they're <laughs> Somebody cataloged a couple of hundred of them at, at one point in time. There, there are five or six that actually work and, and people use more than in an idiosyncratic sort of way. And then there's the legal definitions. And this becomes very, very important. What is a religion according to the law of the land? Now for us, what is a religion is a document uh, a legal document from the IRS as to what would pass and get a tax exemption as a religious organization. And there are actually 20 criteria that, that you have to uh, run the gauntlet through to get, your, uh, get a tax exempt thing. This becomes very important in Europe. For example, in France, you have a whole set of religious groups uh, that are esoteric in nature. They're very large groups. Uh, in France, they have many more esoteric believers than we do in this country. But in France, esotericism is defined as not religion, legally. So they can be part of the government. So when the, when the French government uh, says, you know, it's not religious, many of those people are members of various magical, spiritualist, and esoteric uh, groups. And much of what we would think of here as religious is in France legally defined as not religion. So you get a much lower reporting on the religious life of France because of things like that. All right, let's, uh, I, I'll take if one I'm, more and then we have to finish Okay, uh, a little bit different direction. Thinking about the uh, large percentages of Americans who are religious raises the question of civil religion and its, um, its function or its reality in all of this some people think that uh, civil religion is a very bad thing. There ought to be a Christian critique of it and uh, shouldn't go there. On the other hand, there seem to be positive features of a strong civil religion. So I know that's not quite what we're talking about. Would you, would you comment on this thing that we refer to frequently as civil religion in America? <clears throat> I think civil religion is something that arose uh, mid 20th century just as we turned a majority Christian uh, and reflects the, the kind of lowest common denominator Christianity uh, that uh, now most Americans adhere to. 
Um, and it becomes a way of affirming the religious life of the country at a time when separation of church and state is still operative, uh, largely. And it becomes a way the president can make statements about religion without offending anyone. Um, I, I think that a Christian critique of, of civil religion is one of those things that's needed, just as Christian critique of government policy is. Um, but at the same time, it's a phenomenon that when you've got a supermajority of the country who uh, share the Christian tradition, you're going to get those kinds of expressions. <clears throat> They're going to come out in all kinds of ways from local to regional to national levels, and it's just a part of our life that we, have to, we live with. So with that, I guess we shall invite the rest of our speakers up, and, and are, are we going to, we're out of time. Oh, okay. Well, with that, I'm going to have the last word and say thank you all for attending and for your attention, and uh, we hope we'll be able to, to do this again sometime. Thank you.